to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to look at verse 1 and 2. The title of the message is, Now is the Time. <clears throat> now is the time. <clears throat> and uh, keep me in your prayer. I'm struggling today with cotton mouth, and uh, my voice is really struggling, but we're not going to give the enemy any credit whatsoever or any room. We're going to... Uh, get this message done, and it's going to be received, and God's going to be glorified for it. Amen? As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. And now is the day of salvation. Everybody giving praise in the house right now. The first thing, he is worthy to be praised. And we may be a relatively small number, but don't tell me we can't raise the roof in this house. The interpretation, some understand that in this Verse number one, Paul was addressing the Corinthians and encouraging them to make full use of the grace that had been shown to them. Some rather think that Paul is still giving an account of the message which he preached to the unsaved. He has already told unbelievers of the marvelous grace which had been offered to them by God. Now he further beseeches them. That's a strong word for begs, encouraging, begging them not to receive God's grace in vain. And believe me, many do today. They should not allow the seed of the gospel to fall on barren soil. That is soil that will not produce a good, great, best, or excellent harvest. I mean, when you're sowing seeds for God, there is no reason why it can't explode. Rather, they should respond to such a marvelous message by receiving the Savior on whom it talks about. Paul now quotes from Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8. If we go back and study that chapter, which we don't have time, but you're more than welcome to do it some other time, but not right now. We find that God is in controversy with his people because of the rejection of the Messiah. In verse 7, you see the Lord Jesus rejected by the nation. And we know that his rejection eventually led to his death. But then in verse 8, of Isaiah. We have the words of Jehovah assuring the Lord Jesus that his prayer has been heard and that God would help and preserve him. In the day of salvation, I have helped you. This refers to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The acceptable time and the day of salvation would be ushered in by Christ's resurrection from among the dead. <clears throat> in his preaching of the gospel, Paul seizes upon the marvelous truth and announces to his unsaved listeners, Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know, I love the part of the Bible that says today is the day of salvation. Why such significance on today? Because nobody, you, me, or anyone else has even promised tomorrow. As a matter of fact, he makes it clear in the word, don't worry about tomorrow. 
Tomorrow may never come. You got enough to deal with today. You focus on today, the right, and not just today, but it's critical enough. You need to focus on the right now. Not only are you not promised tomorrow, you're not promised getting home. I want you to understand, right now, the prophecy that is left is during tribulation. The other's been fulfilled. I want to share something else. Nothing else has to happen. Nothing else has to happen for Jesus to return. It could be any minute. It could be the next second. So he is not concerned at all that we know the day or the hour or the time when he's coming. First of all, nobody will ever know it. Even right now, the son don't know it. What he is concerned about now is that we get ready and that we get others ready by our testimony, by our witness, by our faithfulness, by our walk and our talk, that if they're not glorifying God, you're wasting your time, your breath, and your life. Do you hear me, somebody? When he said the two will become one flesh, by God, that's exactly, and I don't say by God in, a, in vain, I say by God because it is by God. When he says the two will become one flesh, by God, that's exactly what he means. The two will become one flesh. Just as the new believers in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, talks about all of the believers, not the lost, but it said all of the believers, not some, not most, all of the believers came together and had everything in common. They had the same heart, the same mind, the same goal. They were about now. And the Bible said, that the Lord blessed them and added to their number daily, every day, those that were being saved. They wasn't just coming together on Wednesday all in one accord. They wasn't just coming together on Sunday all in one accord. They were coming together every single day in one accord, and the Lord was adding to their number daily those that were belonging, coming together, and being a part of the family of God. And how awesome would that be for us today? That the only thing we were ever concerned about, the only thing we ever cared about, is that every one of us was in unison. We were all together. We were all, I know this is going to sound a little far-fetched, but thinking alike, talking alike, walking alike, is it possible? My Bible tells me all things, all things with God are possible. It's only all things with man that are not possible. But if all of us start out right by putting God first and foremost in our life, our heart, our mind, everything about us, every fiber of our being, if we'll get that positioned correctly, then everything else will fall in line perfectly.
and we can be people that fellowship with one another in perfect harmony and that we come together just to glorify God in everything that we do. I'm telling you, you would live a life so powerful you would never want to come down off of the mountain. The era of which Isaiah had prophesied as the day of salvation had already come. So Paul urges men to trust the Savior while it is still the day of salvation to the glory of God. Anybody give him praise in the house. It should be said that although God is the master of time, we are not. In fact, we are pretty much slaves to time. That's the biggest thing we care about. The clock is always ticking, and there is never quite enough time. Do you hear me? It seems that we're always running out of time. Time passes so quickly. I can remember when I started dialysis. And I went in there and I asked this one guy as I began to, he was kind of grumpy all the time and he didn't speak much, didn't say much, just kind of kept to himself. And I, I deliberately kept, just me and him at that time early, and I deliberately kept opening up a conversation so he'd have to talk. And I said, how long have you been doing this? And he said, four years. And I said, four years? And he said, yes. And I said, my God, I've been doing this. And I thought about it, and I went, I've been doing this less than two months, and I already hate it. I can't stand it. I want to quit. I mean, I just want to give up and throw in the towel. I despise it. I know I got to do it, but I hate it. And he said, you don't know how many times I have wanted to give up and quit. And he said, but my family. And I said, yep, that's what you said right there. I got family and I got church family and I couldn't give up either. But now in July, I'll have been doing it now for a solid year in just a couple of months. And I just thought I hated it then. Less than two months. And it's kind of one of them things you don't get used to because you don't like it. You just get in there, get it started so you can get it done. I can't wait till I'm doing it at home. I can't wait. I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. Do you know how hard it is to be in close proximity with 50 or 60 other people? When you've ate something the night before you shouldn't, and you're holding gas in for five hours, and your stomach is in knots and hurting real bad because you know that blanket they put over you when you pass it, Everybody's still going to hear it and know it. And I know what's happening when I see people laying in that funky recliner, stretched out, and you'll see them raise up a little bit. I know they're tightening up. And I start praying too, God, let them hold it. Because the one who's doing that is right beside me. I could almost reach over there and touch him. Now, let me tell you what that's got to do with this. Not one thing. <clears throat> Deadlines are upon us before we know it, and we feel the intense pressure and stress that these fixed moments in time cause us. If only in some way we could stretch time, but we can't. 
the founder of Microsoft, Bill Gates, a man who amassed around $7 billion of personal wealth at that time, because he's worth a whole lot more right now, was asked, what one thing do you want more than anything? And he said, the one thing, he replied, the one thing I would want more than anything if I could get it is more time. Because time is money. And he made a lot of money. Indeed, we would all like more time. Time is a ruthless taskmaster. Can I get an amen from somebody? But for all of our frustrations concerning time, we must remember that time may be less real than what we really think. Do you suppose that God has a calendar in heaven? Do you ever wonder what kind of watch God wears on his wrist? There is no time as we know it in heaven. There God lives in eternity, which is not time drawn out, but it is timelessness. The concept of time is a convention for the benefit of man so that our lives can experience some sense of order and successiveness. Time certainly has a definite impact on all of our lives, and we deal differently with time in different stages of our lives. When we were young, we tended to wish time away. I don't know about you, but I couldn't wait till I was old enough to shave. I couldn't wait till I rode up and was like my mom and dad, where I could do what I want, when I want, go and come as I please, not knowing the older I get, the less you can do it. We were always waiting for something, for some future event to happen. It might have been a birthday or a certain vacation that you like to go, or Thanksgiving, Easter, Christmas, or some other holiday. Time seemed to move incredibly slow back then the more you wanted something. It's like, I don't want to wait for it. I want it here now, and it seemed like it took forever. And the time between the present and that long-awaited-for event was always wished away. I wish it would hurry up and get here. I wish it was here already. We were always wanting to grow up more quickly, wishing our life away without ever really thinking about what we were actually doing. To some degree, sometimes we still do this today by wishing for some future day to hurry up and get here or some future event to hurry up and arrive. I don't know about you, but I had people that were fretting over the eclipse, which didn't turn out the way I wanted it. I was expecting total darkness, but no. But there were people like, how long is this supposed to last? When is it coming? Even some people who watched it with no glasses, my next door neighbor. We tried to furnish him a pair. He put it on, said, I don't like this. I can see better without it. And I'm like, how in the world can you see better without it? You're blind. And for 25 minutes, he stared up at it with no glasses. He was supposed to have mowed my yard a couple of days ago, and I hadn't seen him. He probably can't see. When we want things to hurry up and get here, we want some future event to take place, something to happen. We want it to hurry up and arrive. We may miss the present entirely of what's important right now, but we still wish. We wish for the day when we were younger that we would graduate and no longer have to go to school. We wish for the day that those that chose to go to college that they could get out of college and start their career. We wish for the day that we'd be married to the one that we've fallen in love with. 
not knowing at that time it was puppy love, that you'd be in love a dozen more times before it was over with. But some are not. Some end up marrying their high school sweethearts. And some are still together today, even though most are not. A long, lengthy, healthy marriage seems like it's few and far between. But it is possible. We wish for the day when we can start our own family with children. Then we wish for the day when the children can grow up and get a little older so that mom and daddy can have a date night and they can take care of themselves. And date nights are few and far between. Next, we wish for the day when the children will leave home so the husband and wife can be alone again. Peace and quiet. Not thinking about them watching less TV and having more children. That more grandchildren keep showing up at your doorstep. We wish for the day that we will begin that new job. I remember when I took a new job and went out and bought a $30,000 brand new Formula 500 Trans Am. And this was way back. $322 a month car payment. That's unheard of now. And I can remember having that car for three weeks, being in love with it when I realized that new job I took, I hated it. They put me on, they promised me midnight shift for three months. And then I could have my choice of day shift or afternoon shift, whichever one I wanted, which I wanted days. I was on midnight for two and a half years. Couldn't get adjusted to sleep. I got to wear that car that I loved so much I couldn't stand it. Because all it did was remind me that my life at that time stuck. My job, I couldn't stand it, but I had to pay for stuff. I had to do it. I found myself not even liking the people I was working with. Then I found myself not liking me, which was worse. We wish for the day that we could buy that new car or that new home as people trying to do it today. We wish for the day when we can retire and spend the rest of our lives together and enjoy just doing whatever we want to do. If we have enough retirement to do it without having to go take a job as greeting somewhere because we can't afford to live on Social Security. These are all good milestones in our life, but what about today? You see, if we are always living for some future event, we are wasting away the now that could be the most important time in our life. If we never learn to live in the now, then one day, I promise you, we will look back on our lives and conclude that we wasted so much of our life waiting for the next big thing or event to happen, and in many cases, it never does. Yesterday, in thinking about time, we must think clearly about the past. But it should go without saying that the past is past. What we have done in the past is done and there's nothing we can do about it. And people who can allow the past to be in the past are fortunate indeed. You see, the past can bind us, it can imprison us, and it can cripple us. Some people live in the past. It is in this sense that the past can enslave us. This is not to say that there is anything wrong with memories. In fact, good memories are exceedingly valuable. 
But when the past has a hold of your life and stifles your future, it's a detriment to everything about you. It becomes memories of failures, of our fears, of times we were hurt by others and things we've done that we tragically regret that bring us down, that frustrate us, causing us anxiety, hopelessness. In one sense, this sense, we definitely need to change. Let the past go. In another sense, however, the past is not dead at all, and it should not be, for the past is very much alive in us. The past is what has shaped us. It's what has made us to a certain degree of who we are. Because of our experiences, the past, along with our character, has been formed the way that it is right now. Now, to some, that's good, but to others, it's not. So in a real sense, the past is present with us every moment. So how do you view your past? Is this something that still haunts you? Or is it something that you use to help you? Are there unresolved situations in your past that you need to deal with today? Are there people in your past that you need to contact in order to make something right? Because it's not. The Bible says if you've got ought against your brother, you are to go see them, talk to them, but always with the hopes of encouraging and making it right. Not to prove yourself right and them wrong. Because when you argue, nobody's right. It doesn't matter what the difference is. If you can't come together, it's not a benefit at all. Do you hear me? Yesterday, with my wife, and I'll share something with you. I love that woman more than anything in this world under God. Uh, January, we have been together for 48 years. Soon, we're going to have a 50th anniversary, which is almost unheard of in this day and time. There's as more, if not... There's as much, if not more, divorce in the house of God now than it is in the world. That's how bad it's got. People find it easier to give up and move on to the next thing <clears throat> that might sound good, hear good, or feel good at the time. But if you're not dealing with the things that is causing you problems, Soon, those same problems arise in every single relationship until you deal with it and get it worked out. And most of the time, we find the common denominator is looking right in the mirror. Once I learned that if I wanted change, if I really sincerely or even desperately wanted change. I wanted something to change. I learned that I had to change myself first. And then it brought about all kinds of good changes. But I had to be willing to admit it because for the longest, I wouldn't admit it. And listen, if your circle only has you in it, because you keep convincing yourself you're right. You got a puny, sorry excuse for a circle. If you're the only one at the mountain top, because you can't get along with the others climbing the mountain, you might be at the top, but it is still a lonely old place. If people whisper about you every time you go by, it's you. Are there past sins that you need to confess to repent 
and to turn from and get right with God. The past is past, but it is not dead. We must deal with the past effectively if we are ever going to live in the present happily. Give God praise in the house. <clears throat> Tomorrow, and I'll, uh, I'll rush this up and get this done. Tomorrow, in thinking about time, the next thing we must deal with is the future. Our yesterdays are behind us. Our tomorrows are not here yet. And indeed, our tomorrows never come. You listen to me. When tomorrow gets here, it's today. It should be said about the future that it is uncertain. There is no guarantee that we will live to be 90 or 80 or 70 or 50 or even 30. I have personally known several people who have died unexpectedly at a very early age. You probably have known some yourselves. None of us have a guarantee of tomorrow. Tomorrow is not even ours anyway. God holds our future in the palm of his hands. This does not mean that we do not need to think about the future or even plan for the future. We should certainly do both of those things. But we should consider the possibilities for the future, and we should also be prepared for what the future may behold for us. But we should think realistically about the future if we are to live effectively in the present. The future can give us hope. As we sit here today, we face the beginning of a new year. What will this year hold for us all? We certainly hope that it holds good things. One thing it does hold is the promise that it can be better than the last year if we're still here. It also holds the promise of things that need changed in our lives can be changed if we're still here. While there are no guarantees, it does hold the promise and the hope for good things in 2024, if we are still here. On the other hand, the future can also give us a false hope. It can provide a false sense of security and thereby keep us from living effectively in the present. By assuming that we do have the guarantee of tomorrow, we can postpone many of the things that we need to be doing today. It's called procrastination. This false hope that we will be able to accomplish something tomorrow provides many people with the excuse that they want so they can put off the very thing they need to be doing today. I've met so many people who attempt to live in the future. They're going to do great things when they get around to it. When they have time, they're going to become more involved in things that really count. When this happens or when that happens, then they will begin. They will do it later, tomorrow, next week, next month, someday. The fact is that the time never comes. The situation is never right and tomorrow never arrives. I heard a story of a pastor visiting newcomers to the community. The wife began to attend church, but this man always put the pastor off. He said that he would come to church just as soon as he got straightened out. Every time the pastor would stop by or make a call or come to visit, the man would make the same reply. As soon as I get straightened out, I'll come to church. Finally, the man died. The pastor was called upon to hold the funeral. As he stood behind his pulpit in the church sanctuary, looking down at the coffin with the man inside, he thought to himself, well, he finally kept his promise. Be careful not to let your promises be fulfilled the same way. 
Can I get an oh me on that one, church, from somebody? Today, and the last one, the bottom line of the whole matter is that we only have today. Our guarantee, the only thing we have is right now. It's all we have. This is why the scripture tells us that now is the acceptable time. It's an affirmation that we live in the present. The past is gone. The future may never come, but now is here, right now. Now is the only time we can accept, and it is the only time acceptable to God. The question we must answer is, what are we going to do with the now? <clears throat> Are you spending time now? How are you spending your time now? Are you living in the past or hoping for the future? Are there things you have been putting off until tomorrow? Things which you should be doing now? Are you sitting back thinking that there will come the perfect situation? the perfect circumstance, the perfect time which will enable you to get involved in what you need to be doing. It'll never come. It'll never be right. It'll never be perfect. This is the message we need to hear at this time this year. We must live in the now in 2024 because it is the only time that we have right now. Thank God for the past. Thank God for whatever future that is awaiting us. But live now to the glory of God Almighty. Give Him praise in the house. We must live now in terms of our personal lives and also in the terms of the church. We need volunteers. We need people to come for fellowship. We need to have an awesome meal Wednesday with a group here fellowshipping and loving one another as we break bread together. Even though we need to live in the now, we need to look forward to next Sunday's message if we're still here, if the world is still here. And if it's not, then those of us that belong to him, we have got a fantastic reason by God to praise him because we're going home forever, for all eternity. You see, we cannot simply wait for the future to come upon us. If 2024 is going to be lived for Jesus Christ, it must be lived one day at a time, every day, serious enough, minute by minute. The only time we will have to live will be now. The questions which we need to answer today have to do with what God is telling us to do about now. What are the issues with which we need to deal with today? Are there sins we need to confess? Are there things we need to bring to light before God? Not before anyone else. Do we need to be soul searching in front of God? Today is the day of salvation. God's forgiveness awaits you today if you simply come to him. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30 says, Come to me all. This is the Lord Jesus. Speaking, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. One translation says heavy laden, when it just feels like the world is pressed on you. Come to me, who are weary and burdened, and I, the Lord, will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. 
and you will find rest for your souls because my yoke is easy and my burden for you is light. Psalms 46.1, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. Listen to what that passage says for you. He is an ever-present help in times of trouble, just like God was Israel's refuge and strength and was there for Israel every time they needed him without fail. When you belong to the family of God, God will be there for you every single time you need him. Every eye closed, every head bowed. One magnificent invitation to all who will receive God. is John 3, 16. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that if you would believe in him, you would not perish, but you would have everlasting life. That's for you. And there's no, there's not nobody that doesn't need Jesus Christ now. If you never made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, you can do that today, now, by repenting of your sins and inviting Jesus to come in. He will take you places you've never been and he will empower you to live for him every moment every day of your life, however long you have or don't have. Would you like that today? Would you pray with me today if this is for you? And if you don't know him, my friend, this is for you. Let us pray and repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I believe what you've done for me at the cross. When you died in my place for my sins. Lord, I accept your salvation today. By opening up my heart and inviting you to come into my life right now. Save me, Jesus. I want to go to heaven when I die. I commit my very life to you right now and forevermore in Jesus' name. With every eye closed and every head bowed as Brother Robert comes down to get ready to close us in prayer, if you prayed that prayer today, to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Would you just simply raise your hand right where you sit and let me know that you chose Jesus as your Lord and Savior this morning? I see the hand. Is there anybody else before we close in prayer? I see the hand. <clears throat> Anyone else? What good news? Look up here at me, family. Now, what I want to share, because I'm going to bring him down here. Clint, would you come down with Brother Robert? Clint gave his heart and life to God a long time ago. But Clint totally pulled away from God. Clint went back into the world. He quit trying for God. He quit depending on God. He quit repenting. He quit telling God he was sorry. He totally ran totally in another direction. And he called his mother and he told her that I want to come back to church. And Clint wanted to come. Clint is the prodigal. Clint was the prodigal son who came to his senses and who confessed, God, I have, re 
I have sinned against you. And I want to come home. And I don't care how or what you use me for. I want to come home. And Clint has done that today and received Jesus.